Welcome to the Leafy Podcast, helping real estate investors and entrepreneurs grow. Say hello to your hosts, Jennifer Glagoric and Brian Price, founders of Leafy Legal Services, teaching you how to protect your assets, grow your business, and manage your wealth. Let's start the show. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Leafy Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today, we've got Brian and Jennifer on the line, and they are going to be our hosts, and they are from Leafy Legal Services, the CEO and COO, and uh, they have an amazing guest on, so I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to them so we can get started. Yes, well, today we have uh, someone on our show that everybody w- always wants us to talk about. We get so many requests for this all the time. Uh, our guest today is a successful real estate investor, serial entrepreneur. He's built a seven-figure business, and he started out doing so many different things. So it's kind of a little bit hilarious because he did beef jerky and truck accessories because, you know, those two things go hand in hand. I'm sure they're, they're different uh, businesses. Um, $700 silk sheets. He sold it. He's done it all. And he's moved his way up and done hundreds of deals from wholesaling and flipping. And now he's gotten into, yep, hard money loans. And he's going to tell us a lot more about that and why that can help real estate investors really springboard uh, their business into uh, more deals and uh, it's leveraging other people's money and how this can really help you guys get some skin in the game. So let us welcome today Dave Woof. And Dave Woof is with Boyd, B-O-Y-D, hardmoneyloans.com. Boyd, hardmoneyloans.com. Welcome, Dave. Hey, guys. Hey, Dave. Welcome to the call. So um, I, let's, I, I have to ask, I mean, I know we're going to talk about hard money loans, but I, I want to hear more about your history and how you got actually into it because I want to hear about this brief jerky stuff and <laughs> all that other oh, thing. Yeah, everybody, and by the way, it's my, uh, my dog, Panda Steve, in the background. His picture is not barking, <laughs> but uh, um, UPS They always guys. start barking as soon as you UPS guy must be going by. Um, yeah. Anyways, uh, yeah, I mean, I can't seem to escape the the beef jerky thing. So the first business um, in 2009, uh, I started a internet marketing firm. And in 2014, uh, we decided to start doing our own businesses, our own e-commerce businesses, or sorry, 2013. And the first one was a beef jerky business. So we sold beef jerky online. Uh, hundreds of thousands of pounds of beef jerky. And uh, <laughs> I don't recommend that as a business. It's uh, That's not, a lot of beef jerky. So a was lot it- of, I mean, we sold, we sold like kangaroo jerky and alligator jerky. <laughs> wow. Kangaroo jerky with, so it, was, it had to be drop ship that, that way. No, you didn't have no, a no, warehouse. We, we drop shipped some of it, but we, we had a warehouse of beef jerky. <gasps> uh, there was wow. a period of my life where I just lived off dried meat. So I would just go in. Like, <laughs> I got to tell you, I live with someone right now and he would be like, Oh my God, that's heaven. It was, <laughs> nice. He it was it. nice until my, my wife uh, just kind of started, you know, poo pooing my, my beef jerky habit. So, Oh, uh, and then so from there we, we had a, we had a, we've done pretty well buying um, bankrupts, you know, businesses out of bankruptcy um, and, uh, and revamping them online. And then in 2016, 2017, I got pretty heavy into real estate. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, so what you were mentioning is 700, we, we, we had a business that sold $700 sheet sets. We sold $75 bath towels to the, uh, the richest of the rich, uh, got a lot of NDA based clients that like, you know, it's like we, uh, celebrities and whatnot that don't want people to know where they shop. Um, and so I'm not, not a part of that business anymore, but it's still doing very well. Um, I spent a lot of time focused on real estate. So cool. Well, tell us a little bit about that. How did you go from $700 sheets to saying, you know, I want to do real estate? Or is that something you kind of had been doing a little bit in the background and you just decided to make the leap? So how did that transition happen? Right. Well, I think, uh, I mean, everybody, you know, it, everybody, most people want at least have some sort of interest in real estate. I mean, it affects pretty much everybody. We've all got a house or, you know, got a condo or something like that. And, um, you know, there are more millionaires made from real estate in this country and pretty much every other country than, than any other uh, any other way of becoming wealthy. There's only so many CEOs. You know, there's there's just really very few professions that you can may reliably make you know three, four, five hundred thousand dollars a year um, that doesn't involve being the CEO of a company. So the majority of the people that you know uh, that do very well, unless they're working out hours a week, typically a good portion of them are going to be involved in real estate somehow. So I was always interested in it. Um, and what was the catalyst for that was, 
a current partner of mine that uh, a few years ago was just a friend that I had met, um, and that was James Moore, who's the current CEO of Boyd Hart Money Loans. Um, he was just a friend at the time, and uh, I looked at that as a, he was also an attorney um, in Orlando. So they, they pretty much specialize in um, uh, wills and trusts type of stuff. Uh, and uh, he had been doing hard money, which for those of you that don't know, if you're not familiar, is basically a, uh, like, I guess we should start with that, that description, is a lot of real estate investors, when they go to say, hey, we're going to we'll buy your house cash, they don't have $100,000, $200,000 laying around. Um, and banks are very difficult to get financing from. They require a lot of paperwork. Um, so hard money loans and private lenders basically fill the gap. It's non-bank financing that requires a lot less documentation. Uh, to be able to get the funds to buy real estate. They kind of tend to lean more towards investing in the asset or the property as opposed to underwriting the borrower and needing 33% debt to income ratios and all the stuff you deal with when you go to buy your regular house. Um, so uh, I had, that's, that was kind of my segue in, you know, all the businesses I've done, I've really jumped over, not necessarily based on an idea or that looks interesting, but it's really been people-based. So I always looked for a person that had experience that I said, okay, I can use this person as a way to reduce my risk to jump into something new. And so James was that person for me in real estate. And then since then I've branched out into uh, uh, just a, a lot of different real estate related sub niches um, that, uh, and there's a, there's a lot of ways to make money in real estate. Right. What's your favorite? Like if you had to give your top two real estate ways, the, the deals that you prefer the most, what you g will naturally gravitate to, what would those be? Uh, the easiest ones and the easy ones. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, uh, there are, it's tough. Um, so that's changed over time as my experience has grown and my resources and the connections that I have. Mm -hmm. Um, I kind of started, I'm an internet marketer by trade. So mm -hmm. I tend to be, uh, have, be able to, to find deals easier than most real estate investors. You know, most people, mm -hmm. that's if you were to survey 100 real estate investors, the hardest thing that majority of them would say is that they cannot find a deal that will pencil that's worth investing in. Um, and so I just had not. someone tell me that on LinkedIn, like this last week, I think Tammy and I, they're like, Hey, yeah, I just need to find some deals, you know, like yeah. I've been researching and researching and researching. So yeah, you're well, right. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, the reality is, is that there, there are still plenty of deals out there. I mean, we get deals in a lot of different ways that we do. Um, you know, but I think a lot of it, a lot of it is that people tend to take be more motion oriented than action oriented. You know, they're, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of work, no matter which way you do it, whether you're an internet marketing expert or you're doing direct mail or you're, you're working through realtors, you know, it takes hard work. Um, yeah. And uh, I've, as a lender, a partner in a lender, um, you know, we talk to a lot of real estate investors and they all come to us to get funds and they find their deals in different ways. I mean, there's like, you know, some of them go through attorney networks, others are using realtors, others, talk to wholesalers all day long. So if you guys don't know a wholesaler is a person that um, they'll go out and they'll do the marketing and try to find all the off-market deals and lock them up, but they don't actually ever do any flips or, ha or hold the properties. And then they'll go out to the people that have day jobs and are looking for projects that are maybe good marketers. And they'll say, you know, hey, I have this project under contract. Uh, you know, I have it for 150. I'll sell it to you for 160 with a $30,000 rehab. It's worth 250. Now, a lot of times those numbers are bloated, you know, so you, it's not just, oh, okay, you know, you got to do your own due diligence. But, um, you know, a lot of people say, ah, the wholesalers, you know, there's never any good deals out there. Well, you know, I have a borrower that just, you know, called me uh, last week and sent me over a project that he found through a wholesaler and the numbers look great. It's a, it's a good project. It's a project I would do. And he found that through a, a channel that a lot of people would say isn't a good way to find a deal. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think it's really just about getting out there and, you know, finding a process and, and just putting the time in to, to get it done. Yeah. So when it, when it comes to outreach and stuff, you know, internet marketing stuff, I, I have a background in that as well. And so I can totally nerd out on that, but, yeah. but, um, what, what kind of, um, outreach should someone do? I mean, whether in hard money loans or, or how, how would someone, would you suggest someone reach out? Well, uh, as far as hard money loans is concerned, um, and that's just something that I have an interest in, mm -hmm. uh, that's a little bit more, probably the majority of your listeners aren't going to be as interested. They're more interested in getting a hard money loan probably mm -hmm. than, than doing them. Right. Um, 
you know, more so that I think what they're probably more interested in is how they find deals to, to get houses. So if somebody was going to borrow, uh, borrow for a hard money loan, uh, where would they find the deals and, and what kind of outreach that should they be doing? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think a big part of that is finding, you know, one is picking a target market or something that you're going to be good at and people that are likely to, uh, to actually want to sell their house. Um, and there's some pretty, pretty easy qualifiers for that. So one is they, they, there's a motivation list. So people that the tax deed sale, like people that have delinquent taxes, uh, that's a, that's a big factor for motivation. Uh, you can buy those lists everywhere. Now, those are deals that you're not going to be the only investor trying to reach out to those people. Um, you know, these are people that are getting, it's, it's tough out there. I mean, there's a lot of competition. These are people that are getting cards in the mail, like every other day. Um, you know, saying we'll buy your house cash, you know, but mm-hmm. uh, really, you know, those are, they're going to sell their house to somebody in most cases. It's just, are you going to, because there's other people trying to win that deal, are you going to not try to go after that? Or are you going to, are you going to put the work in to try and win that deal? Um, another thing people do is called driving for dollars. And that's where you go to the area that you think you want to be investing in and you drive around and you find the houses that have overgrown, you know, over the, they have overgrown grass and, you know, maybe there's a code enforcement violation on the door or, you know, the roof looks really, really worse for wear, you know, that the, all the property maintenance hasn't been done and they go up and they knock on the door. Um, you know, I think that's the hardest way to find this, those projects. I don't personally do that, but I do know a lot of people that that's where they find the best deal because they're the only person that actually went up and bothered to knock on the door and talk to the person. Everybody else wanted to do it the easy way and, you know, send out a piece of paper uh, you know, or, or wait for that person to go online, you know, with online leads, you can do it, but it's very expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some of the clicks for somebody saying sell house cash is, you know, it's 50, $60 a click. So uh, it's very hard to just jump into that without mm-hmm. some sort of experience or knowledge. If you're a beginner investor, uh, that, that can be, you know, very difficult. You're going to take a lot of arrows going through that door. So do you use lists to call the buyers directly? Like if you can get, you know, non-owner occupied and you have an idea of the area that you're in. I mean, have you ever done that? Bought lists and then reached out directly to the owner or? Yeah, I have a house actually that I'm buying in Winter Park next week that uh, I don't do it at scale. This was a particular situation where I had bought, I had acquired the property next door or was in contract to acquire the property next door. Mm -hmm. And I thought there would be a a really good opportunity to do some real estate development and basically let one lot borrow some property, some of the land from the other lot. And so I did, instead of buying the list, I actually skip traced the Mm -hmm. owner's contact information. Right. Um, And there's a lot of ways you can look up services online to do that. That'll just mean you can pay for a single record. And, you know, I got the record and I, of that property owner and there were four or five phone numbers on there and I called them and three were wrong. And the fourth one was her, her son. Um, and I called and said, Hey, I'm, my name's David Wolf. I'm, I'm looking, I'm wondering if your mom is interested in selling the property. And he said, no, she's not going to be interested in selling the property. And I said, okay, we'll keep my number in case anything changes. And a month later, I got a call from her other son that uh that had said that her you know his mother was 82 and she was looking to move into an assisted living facility Mm -hmm. and the other son really was hoping to just be able to move into the house without paying anything (laughs) so uh, when everybody else found out that i had called uh he called me back and i'm buying the house i'm getting a a great deal on it um Mm -hmm. and so it it works you know i mean you Mm -hmm. just got to get out there and if you're not having conversations with property owners Mm -hmm. Um, then there's no way, I mean, you got to talk, you got to have the conversations and you got to be in front of the people that are your, are the market. So, yeah. Back in the day, my best friend, you know, my best friend at the time, we were living together. We had a condo together and she was breaking into real estate. Her parents were realtors. And sometimes she would say, let's go look for FISBOs. You know, if you're a real estate um, agent, it's for sale by owner. So yeah. this is before internet. So we, it would be like a fun day out. We'd like, you know, grab some munchies, get in the car. I'd have a spiral notebook and we would just drive through hot neighborhoods and look to yeah. see if anyone had a sign up for sale by owner. And then she'd like, you know, spritz up, put some lipstick on and go up there and knock on the house and say, let me list your thing. And she, 
she did, you know, she ended up doing so well in real estate that she was the Houston area women's association of realtors president more than once. I mean, she's had a illustrious career, but it takes a lot of hard work, especially in the beginning. And then you build up a network and you meet people. That's the one thing that's either really awesome about being a real estate investor and also very daunting for people who are introverts. It's that it is a people business. Well, you still I mean, have to do that there's, there are great, I mean, there's a lot of different niches in real estate. If you're an introvert, I mean, I meet people that don't, they're numbers people and mm. they don't talk to people. Yeah. So if you're not naturally like a person that's going to go up and talk to someone and say that hasn't said, say, hey, I want to buy your house. You know, if you mm. were never thought about being a salesperson or a realtor, mm. uh, you know, maybe that type of, you know, confrontational interaction is not going to be where you're going to succeed most. But mm. there are other people that are great at just running the numbers. You know, yeah. they, they work with a realtor. And they review properties on the MLS and they review, they talk, they work with these wholesalers that are the guys that are go out and naturally talk to mm -hmm. these people. And, you know, somebody will, they'll review the list, you know, they're on a, a mailing list and they get all these leads and the person's like, well, you can have this house for 265. They'll run their numbers. They'll look at all what they think it's going to cost to, mm -hmm. to rehab that house and do all that work. And they say, Hey, I, I don't, I don't agree with your numbers. It's not 265. I'll give you 230 for it. And they'll, hey, they'll and they'll get their deals and they don't have yeah. to ever talk to a, you know, they don't ever have to be the hard selling, you know, yeah. salesperson and cold calling. Uh, you don't have to have that, that, uh, that type of personality in order mm -hmm. to succeed in real estate. You just have to find the right part of the value chain that fits mm -hmm. with your skill sets because mm -hmm. those people tend to be very bad at numbers. So if you analyze enough deals, there's going to be one that makes sense for you that somebody else didn't bother to put the work in for. Yeah, it's funny. We've talked to a couple of people. I'm thinking of Ama, Anna Grand, Ama Grande. Mm -hmm. Remember her, Tammy? And then there was the other multi, she did multifamily only out of Dallas. I, God, why am I not remembering her name? She just had twins, just like Brian. Yeah, I and, forgot. Yeah. yeah. Oh, God, that's I terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and I should remember her off the top Denise of my head. Schroeder? Is that yeah. Of? Yes. Maybe, maybe that's her. And so she um, had very analytical and they did entire dashboards. So she had a background in finance and she paired up with people who actually built her computer modeling profiles to where she can tell you in any area that you're at everything about what is the sweet spot from do you need, I remember we, we talked about valet trash pickup. So mm -hmm. that if you would just offer that, and you could offer it between $25 and $35 that you would be able to get this much percentage occupancy. I mean, she mm -hmm. had it down by each percentage with that because in her business, it was data. With, yeah, with, and with that. we, we so, deal yeah. with a lot of, com I've dealt with, I don't personally have a lot of, mm -hmm. you know, multifamily experience and stuff that it interests me, but the competition is very fierce in that marketplace. So you mm -hmm. really do have to be on top of your game. Um, you know, to, to go in, especially as the, the, the number of units goes up pretty, right. pretty, pretty dramatically, you really got to know what you're doing. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, that's a lot of people that ask me how to get into real estate. They can say, how do I get in without getting, getting my ass handed to me? Um, <laughs> you know, and, and the reality is, is that I, the best, excuse me, the best way is not necessarily a course. I really do think you should educate yourself, but mm -hmm. you've got to find you got to find a mentor. You got to find somebody that you can actually, you know, be kind of a, a minority or the, you know, a, a small tag along on a project or two so that you can really walk through it. You know, Rome wasn't built in a day. Um, mm -hmm. And some people do get lucky and they hit a home run on their very first pro real estate project. But the reality is, is if you've never done a project before, your goal should be to just not lose money on the first deal and yeah. see the, all the pieces of the process. Cause I still learn, Every day. I mean, I learn how to save money on on dealing with contractors. You know, I'm still learning that. I learn different financing, you know, strategies that save money here and there. You get you hone your craft and you get better and better at it. So mm -hmm. coming into it with the mindset of I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna compete against these people that have a lot more experience than I do, and I'm gonna I'm gonna win uh, without any kind of like hands-on coaching or somebody on your team. Is, is really a bad way to go. You, know, you got to have people that can help you, um, help you not get burned at first before you even worry about making money.
Yeah, we do a whole business with helping people just get set up in the right structure so right. that they're not just going out there with no structure, no protections in place. Mm -hmm. um, because when you're new, you're going to make more mistakes than you would. So why are you setting yourself up for a failure that could possibly come back and tank you before you even get, begin? And yeah. once you get the right structure in place, you know, you have a little bit more value in your own mind for it because you've invested in this business mm -hmm. to at least even just set up your entity correctly to where mm -hmm. you can get the best benefit or you have a retirement plan that's working for you that now you're having to be your own bank but being your own bank means that you have to be a lot better with um, how you're making your payments you're going to pay back your bank on time and all the interest then goes to you you know however you set it up can work a lot better for you. So um, I absolutely agree with that statement. Um, and, you know, just from the very beginning, you can start out making smart choices. And uh, there's so much information out there. And there's also a lot of noise. Um, but there are ways to get to the meat of it, you know, when you can. When you're um, a new investor, and you're looking for a hard money loan. So let's say you do have this great deal. Maybe it's a family deal and you know and it's an amazing deal. You know, you have this aunt, she has no kids, uh, they're going to put the house up. Um, yeah. They really just want to sell it because that's the end of stuff. And you're like, oh, if I swooped in, this would be amazing, you know? So how do you go about how much do you need for a hard money loan? Like if they were going to go to BoydHardMoneyLoans.com, fill out the application, what kind of are they looking at? Right, so that's a great question. So I can give you some perfect examples because the one that uh, the one that you just said happens, you know, pretty much every week. Uh, we we talk to somebody like that, and um, it's a lot easier than they they think. So typically, it depends on how much. If you if you were looking to get a loan for that particular issue, I can give you some actual, you know, hard numbers for that. Um, but you're pretty safe. We're not again. We're not the only ones that do you know hard money lending, but in general, um, at most. If you have no experience, you're going to need to come up with, a, with about 25% of the purchase price. If you have some experience, you've got really good credit, um, you know, some of those things play into it, you can get up to 85, 90% of the purchase price. But, you know, if you want to know that you have the deal, um, you need to come up with about 25 to 85% of the purchase price that you're going to be, that you're going to have. Uh, and the one nice thing about hard money is that it's unlike uh, a regular loan. You're not going to have to, we're not going to be as concerned about where that money comes from. So, you know, when you get a regular mortgage, you're like, oh, no, no, hey, I'm going to borrow it from my friend. Uh, and they're like, nah, you can't do that. Um, you know, in the case of a hard money loan, really all you need to show is that that money's in your bank account. It doesn't really necessarily matter as much where that money came from. So it's a lot easier as from a flexibility standpoint to be able to cobble that money together because you know you've got a great deal. Um, yeah. So that's typically how it needs to work. You're going to have to come up with 75 to 85% of that, depending on also how good your credit is. And then the one downside to a hard money loan is you're going to be looking at higher interest rates. So our rates tend to be somewhere between, depending on your experience, your credit score, and the project you're working on, anywhere between 85 to 12% based on your experience and your credit. So an average loan is going to be about 10% for an inexperienced investor with good credit. Um, you know, and so, and that's an interest only loan. So it's not the kind of thing that you want to, you know, you want to hold on to long term. Typically, the, 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 uh, the length of those is about a year to two years. They're designed to be kind of what we call bridge financing, allow you to get the loan. And then if you did get a great deal, right? So let's say it's a $200,000 house, you know, and you're, you're ground or you're on and selling this house. Uh, it's worth 250 as is. And you know that if you just kind of put some floors down and clean the kitchen up, it'd be worth, you know, 300 plus. And she'll give it to you for two hundred thousand dollars, right? So you go out and you get you're trying to find how to do this. Um, you have good credit, and uh, you want to you want to go do this, and you say, okay, will you come to us, and I say, great, we'll finance eighty five percent of that purchase, and we can you can close it in fourteen days. Um, so there's a there's a small process, a couple of things you have to do. We have to get an appraisal of the property, and so on and so forth. But generally, if that's the case, and we funded eighty five percent of that deal. Uh, let's see, you're going to need to come up with about $30,000 plus the closing costs to be able to buy that property. Um, and you can do that in 14 days. So just about anybody, a property, a lot of people don't think that that's a possibility. They're going to have to go through all this hassle. They already have a mortgage. Essentially, if you can come up with $30,000 uh, plus the closing costs, which is probably going to be somewhere around six or seven by the time you're all done on that deal with mm -hmm. title and, and, and origination fees and so on and so forth, 
you know, you can lock that property up. And now in six months, uh, you know, you can go back to a regular bank um, and they'll, it'll be what's called seasoned, you know, where in six months you can get an appraisal from a regular bank and they'll say, hey, your house is worth $300,000 uh, and you can refi with a more traditional mortgage. Uh, you get all your cash out because you only got, you only got, um, you know, a total of probably, what is it, $35,000, right? So mm-hmm. it's pretty easy to get uh, a 75%, you know, refinance from a regular bank. If it's worth 300000 75% of that is right around two twenty five. You know, and so you bought it for 200. Uh, and so you should be able to get all your cash back. And now you've got your low interest rate and you've got the house if you want to turn it into a rental, uh, you know, or if you want to flip it, which a lot of a lot of our, our borrowers do, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you're able to do that for a relatively small amount of money. Yeah, because then you get some money back and then you have money for rehab and everything else. So you have so, to have yeah. it all figured out ahead of time what you think your rehab is going to be. And now you're going to utilize that money. Um, yeah. Yeah. And another, good way to, another good thing you get by working with a hard money lender, if you work with the right one, you know, you can run the project by them and ask them, you know, hey, I'd like you guys to do potentially do a feasibility study on this or tell me yeah. what you think. I'm going to give you my budget. Mm-hmm. Is this a good plan? You know, I have people that all the time they submit something. I mean, I can do a loan on this, uh, you know, because you're, you, you know, you have, you're a secure, like you have a good credit score and you, I know you have money but this doesn't look like a great deal. You're pretty, pretty thin on this project. I, I don't know if I would do this if I was you. Yeah. Um, and sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. You know, some people are okay with making $10,000 on a six month, $200,000 house. Other people wanna make 40. You know, it really just depends on what your goals are and, and what your criteria is and what you're comparing using that money for. Yeah, you, you talked about good credit. Um, what, what kind of factors are you looking for in, in someone's credit when you're, when you're looking at uh, I mean, when you say just good credit, I mean, really, it just makes it easier to uh, when people think about uh, financing. I mean, you can there are there are borrow lenders that you can go out and with a 500 credit score, you can still get financing. It's just that that's going to limit the leverage that you can get. So you're going to have to put more cash down versus, right. yeah, you know, um, versus being able to get higher leverage. And it's mm-hmm. also going to affect it affects the saleability of the note. So if, let's say I, Brian, I haven't looked up Brian's score. I'm hoping it's not 550, but let's say Brian's credit score is 550. Um, no, it's not. When I, when, I originate <laughs> that, when I originate that loan, it's going to be very difficult for me to okay. sell that loan to anybody else. Right, it's, right. Like, well, what's okay. Brian's credit score? So what, what so, kind of a credit score are you looking for? And, and someone that says when you say how? Um, generally, score? I mean, we do them down. We do loans down to 600 credit scores. Um, okay. We've done them in the 500s with a lot of experience. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of it depends. But okay. generally, really, you want to try and be up above a 630. And it becomes much easier to... Um, you know, to do loans, but it's very normal. You know, you're pretty safe. If you're 680, you know, 670, you know, you're very, very workable with if for a hard money loan. Yeah. Uh, the one caveat to that type of thing is that we don't do hard money loans are typically, they don't, they don't do owner occupied. So these are all investor, non-owner occupied related loans. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. And he also says like, you also do ground up construction. So if, if, you know, for that, I mean, what's, what what kind of terms are you looking for with that type of a of a um, a loan if someone wants to do ground up construction? Right. Well, ground up construction. One thing people need to know is typically it's definitely a lot more cash intensive. Um, you know, it's as far as uh, you know. I mean, if you're going to build a house for you know, you're doing very good. If you can build a twenty five hundred square foot house for two hundred fifty thousand dollars, you're doing you're pretty efficient as a builder right now. That's just yeah. the the construction, you know, cost. If you add a, if you add a, let's say somebody doesn't own the lot yet, um, you know, if you add a lot and you're paying fifty thousand dollars for a lot, you know, that's three hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars. Generally, it's a good safe bet that you're going to need to put about a hundred thousand dollars in cash into a project like that in order okay. to be considered for new construction. It's a longer yeah. timeline. There's more risk in it. Um, mm-hmm. Experience does help, um, you know. But uh, for the most part, that's a pretty good number. Is so, like take what your mm-hmm. what your um, you know, as a starting point, if you're going to consider trying to get finance for new construction, mm-hmm. uh, you would take what your what your lot would cost. Or if you bought it in the past, you know, essentially you can look at that like cash, like that you have to bring to the table, um, and uh, and then add the construction cost of the house, and about a third is what you're going to need of that combined amount uh, to do a new construction. So, I mean, to give you an example, we have a project right now that you know is going to go up in two weeks. Um, there's a 600,000, a big house is a $600,000 build cost and the, it's on a lake. So the lot was 300,000. 
So it's a $900,000 project. So that's going to require about $300,000 in cash. Okay. okay. So what about the, this situation? Because I was just at like a coffee shop talking to someone. I live in a resort town, Galveston. So here, Airbnbs and Verbo and just renting extra space are huge. Mm -hmm. So because of the way majority of houses here are, are old, you know, we have a lot. My house is over 100 just at a hundred years old. And, uh, you know, so everybody's got a plaque on their stuff, but people are still looking for ways to, um, there's a, I guess, short-term and long-term renting thing. So let's say you own your lot and you have no zoning or anything like that. And you wanted to add a rental, but mm -hmm. it's owner occupied for the house and you don't want to go traditional for whatever reason. So you want to build in the back of your house, let's say on top of the garage, now you have a rental unit, right? right. Is that something that somebody could go to hard lending with? Because they asked me, I said, you know, I don't, I don't even know. I'm going to have to ask. And I forgot about it until we were talking. Well, I mean, the answer is yes. I mean, but it's going to say it depends. I can give you the mm -hmm. requirements on that. But yeah, I'm mm -hmm. very familiar with the Airbnb. I'm actually doing a four, uh, a fourplex um, renovation mm -hmm. in Mystic, Connecticut with a, with oh. a joint venture partner that's, that's going to be an Airbnb. He does oh, okay up up there and that's a older 1925 it was a single you know large yeah. large house that's now four units yeah um, and uh you know that's being done specifically to be airbnb it's right by mm -hmm. a marina it's beautiful yeah. um but uh and and we, that was done with a hard money project mm -hmm. so um what you're talking about is there's gonna be a couple things you know as, mm -hmm. as far as doing that with a hard money loan is is mm -hmm. there a primary mortgage there mm -hmm. usually is that creates a problem because you're either going to have to refi the primary mortgage into a first, mm -hmm. you know, or what you're really looking for is a, is a home improvement loan, which would be a second mm -hmm. mortgage. Mm -hmm. And that's, there, there are people that do that, but it's mm -hmm. much harder to go out and find a hard money loan that's willing to be in a second position uh, than oh. a first position mortgage. It's always going to be harder to, to get a second. And the other one is, is it a primary residence? Mm -hmm. So if it's a primary mm -hmm. residence, you're going to have a very difficult time finding hard money loans uh, just because of the fact that the rules are so much different and it's, it's just, it's very difficult to do as an investor mm -hmm. to, to lend on an owner, uh, owner occupied uh, a building. Okay. There's a lot more protections for the consumer that that investors don't want to deal with. Okay. Okay, good. Well, it's actually my, my neighbor because she's got an Airbnb in her regular house and yep. she wants to do it. I was thinking it was a coffee shop and I was like, no, that's, this is lady next Now, so. now <laughs> so I, I was an advisor, you know, if she mm -hmm. was to transition the ownership of that property to an entity, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and was willing to sign an affidavit that's not primary residence, now you're talking about a slightly different story. She mm -hmm. may be able to do, uh, you know, hard money loan to, to be able to do the construction and improve mm -hmm. that, you know, get that second building but the zoning requirements are, that's a totally different story is mm. is that a permitted use of the property you know mm. the reality is is that we're not even going to ask that question if mm. if she has a uh, you know if she has enough equity in that in that property and mm -hmm. she's looking for a loan to do a, a renovation mm. what she ends up doing with that renovation is uh, in a lot of cases is, is really up to her as long as she mm -hmm. has enough equity to, to be able to do a hard money loan we're going to be uh, and we're going to be a little bit a lot more flexible than a traditional bank is going to be concerned but it's going to have to be owned in an entity and she won't be able to live there so she's got to weigh the benefits of she's going to lose the homestead exemption mm -hmm. you know that she yeah have. yeah we have very powerful homestead exemptions there's no limit no cap in texas yeah. really so yeah unlike investment. other states you know, i've seen a lot of tax bills that i was like oh that's really cheap and then i take it over and i get the new tax roll bill without the home exemption and you know, not only is it that, but, you know, I'm buying it from somebody yeah. that has lived there for 30 years. So, you know, next year it goes from 72000 to, uh, you know, yeah. $300,000 taxable assessment without yeah. exemption, and that tax bill goes up pretty quickly. So, yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's not always sometimes, you know, it's just that it, the numbers don't pencil out. So right, I think real right, estate right, right. is really creative and it's about, you know, a lot of times it's about creating mm -hmm. cash flow, but, um, you know, you, the more you do outside of, you know, getting super creative, like, you know, mm -hmm. starting to be like, maybe this is not zoning compliant. Mm -hmm. I really think the more money and I I'm all for, you know, testing the boundaries on my mm -hmm. own real estate activities. Mm -hmm. um, but I really think you got to make sure that you're making enough money to justify the added risk of, you know, mm -hmm. doing something that, uh, you know, the city may not be, uh, you know, uh, okay with because you could put mm -hmm. yourself in a real pickle. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, thanks, Fran. That was my, my big question. And now I'm going to yeah. saunter over as an expert and say, yada, 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 yada. It's going to be great. So it's going to be awesome. 
Okay, well, we're getting at the end here. So we've been talking with Dave Woof. And if you want to get a hard money loan and you want to learn more about how you can leverage other people's money for your success as a real estate investor, then just head on over to Boyd, B-O-Y-D, hardmoneyloans.com. That's all together, Boyd, hardmoneyloans.com. Brian, do you have any parting questions for Dave before we go? Well, yeah, David, um, why don't you give us uh, any kind of other information that maybe people would, should know with hard money loans that we may not have talked about that uh, that's just they should probably know. Do you have any parting uh, wisdom you can give to our listeners? Yeah, um, so I had a hard time hearing because my dog decided to sit down his beanbag right behind me below. Okay. So you guys <laughs> need Ken and Steve here. That's the... That's the real oh, okay. Oh, <laughs> sugar. Oh. Looking um, at himself in the picture, like, okay. yes, I am the king. I think you had a, uh, yeah, I think you had a question about anything else that people should know. Uh, but the really thing is if you're, if you're legitimately, you know, trying to become, trying to build, you know, uh, a real estate investment portfolio, I think it's about having a, you, you really should be working on what we call your finance stack. So that it doesn't matter how much money you have, whether you've got fifty thousand dollars or or half a million or ten million dollars, you know, you really should be trying to to uh, um, to build a, a successful capital stack. And what that is is, you know, if you can get a bank to give you a loan, you're going to get the best rates. You're going to get four and a half, five percent. You know, you should absolutely be working to be bankable, to have the proof of income and your documents in place to be able to go get those loans. But if you can't get those loans or if your project requires a faster speed, you should have a hard money lender lined up in a relationship that you're developing so that you have somebody reliable, you know, professional hard money lenders, they don't run out of money. You know, we have, we have billions of dollars because a lot of this gets, ends up getting packaged together in large products and sold off to hedge funds. Um, you know, so, uh, so we have, we don't run out of money, but then the next step is if you're really working, you should develop your, your, your network and you should find a private lender and the private lender is rich uncle Joe, you know, that is going to be the most lenient of all, you know, he, he may just require a couple paragraphs of information about the project and then say, yeah, I'll have my attorney write it up, but doesn't need any form of documentation whatsoever. I, if that, is that a good idea for uncle Joe? I don't know. I wouldn't do it, but, um, you know, I know a lot of a lot of real estate a lot of a lot of real estate investors that they come to me when their rich uncle Joe or their you know their guy is on vacation for the summer or is just you know his money's tied up on another project. You know, they go to him because they give him a better rate, and you know, but if he's not available, you want to have that back up for fast. And if you can get bank finance, you want to do, and then you want to have cash. So it's really just about making sure that before you need the money you have a diverse set of options to be able to take advantage when that hard fought deal does come up. Um, you know, that you know that you're not going to lose out on a deal because you didn't go do the, do the work to make sure that you had your entity set up or that you, uh, you know, or that you didn't have the money in place. Cause once, once you have it running around scrambling and trying to find it, it's going to be a lot more difficult. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's really good advice. And I'm glad you ended with that. Cause I, I think that, we definitely is the more funding you can get ahead of time, even before the deal happens. I think you, the more success you'll have, you know, landing the deal too, even once you find it. So I think that's, that, that's yeah. a great thing. To and I, I can't tell you somebody that does financing. I can't tell you how many times I've been able to just say one or two things to an investor that I talked to that um, has helped them structure that deal or, or with the contract, go back and say, Hey, you know, with this, with the seller, can I do this, you know, or can you do this with me and change maybe the terms of the agreement so that they can work a little bit better and save a thousand dollars here or thousand dollars there. Like, you know, Hey, go back and see if they have the survey so that you don't have to pay for another survey. And and those are just, that's just about working with experts, um, you know, to save yourself a little bit of money here and there. That's great. That's awesome. So, yeah, we've been talking with David Wolf and, uh, you know, go to BoydHardMoneyLoans.com. And, uh, David, I appreciate you being on the call. It's been really a lot of information and I uh, appreciate you being here. And, uh, Tammy, you want to take us out? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks again, Dave, for joining us. And uh, Jennifer and Brian, thank you so much for hosting again today. Uh, I will have all of Dave's information in the show notes right below. You can find our podcast, Leafy Podcast, anywhere that you can listen to a podcast, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, everywhere you go. And uh, you can also find us on social media at Leafy Legal. 
And if you do have a question for Dave or for me, or you just want to leave a comment about the show, email me at Tammy, T-A-M-M-Y, at Leafy Legal Services, and I'll get right back to you. Thanks again, everybody, for listening, and uh, we'll see you next time. Have a great week. Attention real estate investors and entrepreneurs. Did you know that real estate investors are a primary target for lawsuits? According to the National Survey of the Court data, 25% of Americans risk being sued in their lifetime. However, if you are a real estate investor, you have a 95% chance of being sued in the next 20 years. Leafy Legal Services helps you protect your assets and strategically grow your business and wealth. Leafy Legal Services are experts at the Series LLC and Delaware Statutory Trust. Trust, two of the newest and most ideal legal structures for real estate investors. Leafy Legal Services have the most personalized and affordable solutions for setting up LLCs. Property owners are always at risk when it comes to their assets. Anonymity is so important. If you own just a rental house and you own your home, you have to protect yourself and your properties from any potential legal issues. Leafy Legal Services have the right solutions to make sure you are happy and feel secure. They offer cost-effective documentation that suits their clients' needs. For a free consultation and ebook, visit leafylegalservices.com. They are waiting to hear from you. Leafylegalservices.com. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Don't wait. Take action now. Leafylegalservices.com. Protect your assets, grow your business, and manage your wealth.